So, so as I go through these questions at this time, so I'm going to be skipping all of the calculation questions. I've covered them already. And for the multiple choice questions, I'll probably skip most of them. Uh, it's uh, usually the kind of conceptual questions that to worth uh, spending uh, uh, that I initially think is worth uh, spending time on uh, are usually um, asked in the form of multiple answer questions because that's where uh, one there's more just combinatorial possibilities. So I'll just get started uh, from the beginning and I'll just scroll to the end, skipping the questions that uh, that you know that I'll skip this time. So. Yeah, so this uh, question one is an example of question that I will skip because it is a reading check and it's a, it's a you know, review the section and it um, you can almost kind of search the section through ultraviolet catastrophe and you will see the description and one of these will match. Uh, I don't think there's much more. I can add that um, that I think you can get a lot better by reading through the section. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so this is one of the conceptual questions that I'd like to go through. Um, and, and like with many of the conceptual questions, it is, um, most of the content is addressed in the sections. <laughs> That's why I hint to links out you out to these sections, telling, them to, telling you to review. Um, and uh, let's uh, look through the choices and see which, um, Choices might be tricky. Um, it's a, the first one says the quantized energy comes in unique quantities that are equal to H. Okay, so this is where you do have to be a little bit careful. Let me actually bring up one of these sections so that um, understanding of Planck's constant H, it's important thing to touch on when you are going through quantum mechanics uh, because there's an aspect of it that uh, uh, quantitative, it involves numbers, but at the same time, there's an aspect of it that's uh, actually qualitative, as in it's uh, quite conceptual. It's not so much about this exact number, but it's more about what the number represents and how you should understand it. So let me just copy it down here. H is equal to the number here. So th this numerical value here, that's like the thing that I care the list about, but in case I need it, let me write it down. 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34. You can see it's a very small number. And the unit here, that's actually the most important part, joule second. So let me write it down. And this, uh, um, the way it's written here will help me answer some aspects of this question here. So the first one says the quantized energy comes in unit quantities that are equal to age. And um, you can see from how this is written that that can possibly be right because H Planck's constant comes in units of joule times a second. This unit joule here, that is the unit of energy. And this is second here. That's a unit of time. So whatever significance Planck's constant have, by itself, it does not mean energy. So, so the first one is wrong because it, um, the, if we want to say some energy, quantity of energy is equal to something, that this other thing has to have a unit of energy. But Planck's constant, it doesn't have a unit of energy. This unit of energy times time. So, um, so it means something slightly different from just the unit of energy. The second one says the quantized energy comes in unique quantities that are <laughs> proportional to H. That is correct. And one of the things that these two sections address is that, um, it, uh, uh, I guess uh, it becomes cl most clear in the uh, context of photoelectric effect, where the energy of the photon is given by Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. So this is the, the quantized uh, un uh, energy amount, and that is proportional to Planck's constant. Um, and it does depend on one other parameter. Um, 
Moving on, Planck's concise and precise understanding of the so classical mechanics. Uh, okay, um, I think uh, starting from here, I would say no. Uh, the significance of Planck's constant is that it's the fundamental constant that represents quantum mechanics, really. Uh, whenever you see Planck's constant in some result, some error, it's a dead giveaway that quantum mechanics play the role. So why does this keep moving? Um, so, so this is kind of like the exact opposite. Uh, I mean, if something is just the classical mechanical, you wouldn't expect to see Planck's constant. So not checking that. Uh, Planck's constant H has unit of energy. Yeah, that's what I said up here. Um, why does it keep scrolling? Sorry, that's super annoying. Um, okay, although named after Max Planck, it was really our, uh, no. Uh, Max Planck, I think he actually uh, got this value uh, of constant as he was developing his Planck law, uh, the law that describes the, the, the black body radiation. I mean, Einstein did take it one step ahead further, but he didn't discover this constant. Uh, Planck's con yeah, it does not have unit of energy. So, okay, so these two should be the correct choices. Yeah. So, so yeah, I and um, I, you know, in this conceptual physics class, I don't, I try to try to avoid putting undue emphasis on numbers. And um, the Planck's constant as a quantity is one of the things that I do emphasize because the emphasis here is at its core really conceptual. It's the importance of this number, whatever its value may be. I mean, there's some importance in that this is a small number and that explains why it took us so long to discover it in, that it's even there, but um, it, uh, so I would say Planck's constant, it's one of the things that you should do. Um, make sure that you understand it. Uh, um, yeah. It, it, yeah. I guess so when, as we go through modern physics in quantum mechanics, special relativity, I think you are going to see some, uh, quite a bit of unprecedented, unprecedented importance placed on certain physical constants. Planck's constant is one of them. Next to it, you will see uh, speed of light as a constant. Um, and actually one of the constants that we consider to be fundamental constant of nature uh, that you actually have seen is the gravitational constant capital G. These three um, physical constants, they, they kind of tell you some basic fundamental properties of our universe. So with that, let me move on. Uh, yeah, so this is a calculation question. I did it in that 40 minute video, so watch that. Uh, I'm gonna move on <laughs> from the question. And I think it's the same deal for this one. Uh, I think I actually did a whole lecture on uh, photoelectric effect in connection to this question in the other 40 minute video. Um, okay, so. So this question is also a reading check question, which is why it is basically telling you to read the section. And, and since it's a multiple answer question, let me go through each of the choices and explaining uh, why it's correct and why it's not. It says, uh, choose all statements below, which correctly describes an aspect of photoelectric effect. Uh, so, okay. So, you know, if it's not correct, I won't. Pick it. Um, Einstein's the theory of photoelectric effect explained why metals are conductors by proving the. Okay, I'm just making up something here. I mean, you know, there are discovery of electron that was uh, something significant. I think J.J. Thomson did that. Um, development of the theory of solid matter that distinguishes conductors from insulators is also significant development. Um, that's the, I guess in this class, we don't cover it at all. Um, you read about like a band gap theory and all that uh, good solid, solid state physics stuff. Um, now, nah, none of those have anything to do with the photoelectric effect or the theory of photoelectric effect. Um, so, 
not that. <laughs> That's just, yeah. The photoelectric effect, uh, which is ejection of electrons when light shines on a metal surface, right? On an insulator, the, the electrons are too tightly bound to the atom. So that's why it has to be metal surface. Of course, only for light of sufficiently high frequencies. Yeah, and in fact, this is the one of the features of the uh, effect that really needed Einstein's um, development of, Einstein's, um, I don't want to, I shouldn't call it partially, assumption that uh, light behaves like a particle, the, the, that um, it's only at those high frequencies where the photon has enough energy to eject electrons. And, but that experimental fact was known before Einstein explained why. And it's Einstein's explanation that um, that, is, uh, that is new in the 20th century. Uh, by modeling the interaction between light and electron as collision between two particles, Einstein was able to explain all experimental features of the photoelectric effect, yes. And in fact, uh, let me point to some of those experimental features that are highlighted in your textbook. So when you read it through a section, um, I think there's a, a summary of all the features, yeah. Uh, as people studied the photoelectric effect, following properties became evident. And so there are some number of them that were kind of curious, hard to explain. And really the one that's uh, most difficult to explain in the um, uh, paradigm of classical mechanics, classical ENM, is the existence of this threshold frequency that will cause the photoelectric effect to happen. Okay, by modeling the electro, yeah, okay. <laughs> by as containing third, I'm beginning to see I'm making some stuff up. So no, um, electromagnetic wave is really the, 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 the mutually supporting wave of electric field and magnetic field. There isn't anything more to that. Um, the quantum mechanical nature, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of, you know, out of the box, you can't uh, describe it as there being a third unobserved component. Um, okay. The photoelectric effect is action of electrons when light shines on the metal surface shows that, oh yeah, this is incorrect. In fact, if you read through this description here, uh, if we measure kinetic energy of ejected electrons, um, the kinetic energy only depends on the frequency of EM radiation. That's also something that is difficult to explain within the classical paradigm. So, okay, I think it's just these two. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, this question I did in that 40 minute video, so I will skip. Same thing with this one. I don't know if I did both questions six and seven or only one of them, but in terms of calculation, they kind of deal with the same kinds of calculations. So. No, skip. Okay. So question eight. Uh, this is one of those multiple answer questions. So let me look at that. Um, yeah. So the question deals with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And I would say along with um, your understanding of Planck's constant in conceptual terms, how important it is to quantum mechanics. The uncertainty principle is probably one of the most important thing to understand as you try to understand quantum mechanics. Because uh, quantum mechanics has this uh, unfortunate thing that it draws a lot of mystical things. Uh, so mentioned this somewhere. Uh, if you are interested, uh, Google search for a phrase, quantum woo -woo, uh, woo as in W O O. Um, it, uh, you know, people who frankly don't know anything about quantum mechanics <laughs> try to use words in quantum mechanics to lend credence for whatever nonsense it is they're saying. I want to stay really far away from that. I'm here to teach you physics, not whatever mysticism there is out there. And, um, and one of the things that I think you can understand, try to understand that really conceptual level is uncertainty principle. And once you have a good conceptual grounding for that, I think it will 
inoculate you against uh, whatever nonsense and mysticism is out there. So with that, <laughs> let's go through this question. Choose all statements below which correctly describes the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or one of its consequences. Okay. Um, the uncertainty principle says that you can precisely measure the position of a particle only by imparting a large uncertain momentum to it. Oh, that's a tricky one. I want to say yes. Um, yeah, I want to say yes. So really when you are talking about uncertainty principle, what you have to rely on is uh, this statement here. This is the most basic statement of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that uh, two measurable physical quantities, position and momentum have intrins intrinsically linked uncertainty. And um, that's kind of summarized in this expression here. Uh, uncertainty momentum, Oh, sorry. Uncert uh, uncertainty in position, delta x, and uncertainty in, uh, this is the expression I like the best, um, uncertainty in position multiplied to uncertainty in momentum. There's a minimum value that this product can be, and that the minimum value is Planck's constant divided by some other numerical constants on the order of Planck's constant. And um, so when you have precise measurement of position of a particle, meaning you have a small position uncertainty, then it means in order to have hold to this minimum value, your momentum has to be great. Oh, sorry, your uncertainty in momentum has to be great. And, um, and I think in the uh, follow-up lecture using the, the FAT simulation, I want to illustrate uh, how that comes to be uh, kind of in a mathematical conceptual sense. The part that's uh, making me hesitate a little bit is aware only by imparting a large uncertain momentum to it. Um, I'll still say that sounds like largely true because uh, that's a kind of the part of how you come to have a uh, large uncertainty in momentum when a particular particle state has a, a, a great precision in position. So let me, I checked that. So um, let's look at the next choice. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle puts a limit on how precisely momentum of a localized particle can be measured. Um, yes, I think um, that, uh, yeah, I think that this is kind of uh, the other side of the first statement. So first statement uh, uh, looked at how precisely can you measure position of something. Here it's looking at, well, how precisely can you measure the momentum of something? How small can you get delta P to be? And this uh, statement, this adjective localized means um, that the uncertainty in position is, it's not infinite, it's uh, finite, it's uh, localized within some um, interval. So, um, so yeah, these two statements are saying basically the same thing, unless I was trying to be overly tricky. <laughs> well, so we didn't see. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle puts a, uh, Theoretical limit on how precisely masses of subatomic particles can be measured? Not really. Um, there are some um, there are some exceptions. Um, I think in your textbook, do we talk about energy time uncertainty principle? Yeah, I think I might have. Um, so there's some way in which you can take that interpretation, but only for uncertainty. Uh, only for unstable particles that you will see in about two weeks. But for now, uh, no, that it does not put, so for example, mass of a hydrogen atom, there is no theoretical limit on how precisely we can determine the mass, not in theory. Okay, 
uh, the uncertainty principle says that the more significant figures you measure for the velocity of a particle, the less, yeah, I think here I'm just stringing words together. This is whole nonsense. In fact, uh, um, because kinetic energy is entirely determined by velocity and mass, if you precisely measure velocity, of course, your kinetic energy will be very precisely determined. So this is not true. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is an inevitable consequence of wave particle duality of nature. Yeah, it is. Um, I think in your textbook, I do mention it. Um, yeah, there's a kind of wordy description of that, but um, I, let me get through this and I will try to um, demonstrate this using simulation. <laughs> so unless I was trying to be overly tricky, that should be it. <laughs> Sorry, the wording of the first two sentences made me worry, but okay. Um, let me keep going for the remainder of the questions. Um, so this is a reading check. You kind of read it through to the thing and uh, there's some number scales. And uh, and I want you to notice something, how, um, how, how do I say it? Um, so there are certain areas where you might have a bit of an uncertainty on what the correct answer is. Like the size of the atomic nucleus, is it 10 to minus 15 or is it 10 to minus 14? And um, that's what this other part is for. Because 10 to minus nine meters is a nanometer and one nanometer is really large for, a, for it to be size of an atom. Size of a hydrogen atom is uh, uh, 10, an angstrom or 10 to minus 10 meter. So, yeah. so you know, uh, for numbers that are that appear to be very close, the other number will um, usually uh, disambiguate it for you. Okay, question ten. Yeah, this is um, Rutherford. The experiment is uh, um, it's one of the important steps towards quantum mechanics, particularly in the area of atomic model. And your textbook describes it, you know, review <laughs> section 13.5 for uh, which of these are. And I think, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, choice is riffing on actually one of the quotes from Rutherford. He likened uh, his experiment like uh, firing 15 inch shells at a piece of tissue paper and it coming back and hitting you. And, but you know, that's what to call metaphor or uh, similarly, it, it, he didn't actually do an experiment with 15 inch shells. So even though you can find a quote about this, I think if you just the Google search it, the quote will come up, but um, yeah. So, so that's a quote by him, but you know, that's not the actual experiment he did. Um, so, you know, sometimes people can be overly literal. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I think, so I think I mentioned this in one of the recorded uh, lectures, really um, to give you the uh, grounding in hope, uh, understanding Bohr model of hydrogen atom. That is actually why uh, we made sure to cover the circular motion and angular momentum that's associated with the circular motion because the Bohr's key assumption was this one, that um, angular momentum of an electron in an orbit is quantized. And you know, that sentence has no meaning unless you know what angular momentum means. <laughs> and so, so that's why we made sure to cover angular momentum way back in unit two. Um, so, so if you've forgotten it since then, go back and review it, you know, angular momentum, rotational motion, it was covered in uh, chapter seven. So um, go back and look at it. Uh, so, and we covered the circular motion in chapter two, section 2.8. Um, so th these sections are something that I might have chosen to take out, except that I wanted you to uh, make sure that you could uh, fully understand what the uh, what Bohr's assumption that angular momentum of an electron in its orbit is quantized. I wanted you to be able to understand that sentence. So, okay. So with that, I won't actually answer it. You can answer it yourself. 
Um, this is a calculation question. Um, oh, this is, all right. Yeah, this is a multiple answer question. And um, I guess it's uh, worth going over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mainly because, so, you know, this is, so I think uh, I do want to have an opportunity to say, you know, what things are all utterly incorrect. And uh, I might even be able to point out to point you out to places where it, where in the chapter it is exactly mentioned. So so let's take a look at that. Um, um, so quantum mechanics is one of the two revolutions in physics that took place in the early 20th century. Uh, the other one is the special relativity that you will learn next week. Uh, so choose all statements below, which correctly describe quantum mechanics, its assumptions, and or its uh, consequences. So, you know, don't pick any statements that are wrong. Quantum mechanics categorizes all physical things as particles or waves, depending on whether the thing obeys the quantization rule or not. No. So this categorization is, um, it's something that we are implicitly doing in classical mechanics. Um, so back in unit, um, back in unit two, when we were talking about waves and oscillations, um, you know, you had a way of looking at waves, waves on a string that was nothing like a particle. So in classical mechanics, there was this implicit separation between things we treat like a particles, you know, baseball, and things we treat as waves, like sound waves or waves on a string. Um, th there was that separation, even if we didn't explicitly do it, there was that separation. And in quantum mechanics, those boundaries blend. Everything that is a particle has a wave nature, and everything that is a wave, like sound wave, has a particle nature. So for light, the particle of light wave is photon. There's actually a particle or elementary excitation that corresponds to a particle of sound wave that's called a phonon when you do like solid state physics. So this is wrong. That attempted separation is what quantum mechanics does away with. Um, second, a new physical constant discovered by Max Planck plays an important role in every quantum mechanical phenomenon. Yes, that's Planck's constant. And again, um, when you see a Planck's constant, especially in places uh, when you didn't expect, is a dead giveaway that whatever it is you're looking at, somehow in unexpected ways, maybe deals with the quantum mechanics. Unless it did, you wouldn't see a Planck's constant. The rules of kinematics, parallel trajectories, constant motions, etc., continue to be important in quantum mechanics. Not really. Um, so, in quantum mechanics, what becomes important are descriptions of position and momentum of things, and they're described in a way in ways that position and momentum. Things may not have exact value of position and momenta. And description of things like a trajectories actually relies on you knowing precise positions of things at all times. So um, in quantum mechanics, one of the things we give up on is the notion from classical mechanics that you could describe precise position of a particle at all times. We give up on that idea. So um, like parabolic trajectories, these are no longer important in quantum mechanics. Um, the concept of energy and momentum turn out to be more important in quantum mechanics. The uncertainty principle says that, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you see it in physics jokes. Um, it, I guess there's a joke about, uh, I don't know, particle that was caught speeding and never mind. Because um, uncertainty principle absolutely does not say that everything is uncertain. It's quite limited the principle that relates uncertainty in one thing, uncertainty in position, with uncertainty in another thing, uncertainty in momentum. It, the principle says that there's a relationship between those two, um, what used to be disconnected uncertainties. And, and when you go deep, more deeply into quantum mechanics, there are other versions of uncertainty principle, but, and they all end up relating measurements of two or more quantities and, and tie what 
in classical mechanics, you would have considered unrelated uncertainties together into that uh, inequality that you've said. So, but it does not mean this. Um, I mean, you know, uh, no, well, actually laws of physics can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, in fact, what we usually try to do is prove them beyond even unreasonable doubt. Um, what can be done is proving them in the, in the sense you uh, prove mathematical theorems. Uh, that's not what we do in science. <laughs> so let me leave that there. The ideas of energy and momentum continue to be important in, yeah, I think I was just saying that in connection to this. Uh, and energy and momentum are important measurable quantities from quantum mechanics. Several physical quantities become quantized, allowed only in discrete quantities in some situations in quantum mechanics. Yes, um, you've seen that with the Bohr model. Uh, angular momentum is quantized and that quantization forces, quantization of energy levels and other things. And at the same time, uh, it's not necessary that all physical quantities are quantized. Uh, in fact, let me show that with um, one of the simulations. So I think that's everything. Um, yeah. So um, um, yeah, let me know if there are any questions on any of those explanations, <laughs> likely as you are watching the recording. <laughs> um, okay, let me move on. Oh, uh, I think this is something you should read and do because uh, you should do, read about each of these scientists and match them up with, um, uh, with um, what their contribution was here. Uh, Einstein is potentially one where you might have um, tried to match it him up with the multiple ones, but we haven't covered the special relativity yet. So there's a really only one thing in quantum. I mean, Einstein actually made many contributions to the field of quantum mechanics, uh, but there's only one that's mentioned in this class. So, so. Uh, the other one where I remember seeing his name when I was taking, when I was a physics major was something called uh, spontaneous emission. There's a, something called Einstein coefficient there, but. We don't mention this, so, and that's not one of the choices here. Spontaneous emission of uh, uh, light, yeah. Okay, so I think that's uh, all the questions here. Um, probably take, took longer time than I needed to. And um, and really these uh, topics in modern physics are ones where uh, I hope you see, I, I hope you uh, learn something that maybe you didn't expect. And maybe, so, you know, learning unexpected things, that, that's what learning means. And <laughs> um, I, I hope what you will find newly in modern physics is learning things that, um, that you might consider counterintuitive even after you learn it. Um, with the classical mechanics, very often once you learn it and understand it, then it's all intuitive. I think the closest thing to counterintuitive thing in classical mechanics is, I don't know, Newton's first law that uh, moving things uh, continue to move if you don't constantly apply a force on it. Uh, but, you know, once you learn about friction and learn to think that through, then classical mechanics, a lot of it really makes intuitive sense. It's a things in modern physics where it actually takes a lot more work to develop that intuition. So I hope you see that as you're working through quantum mechanics and uh, I guess next to special relativity.